just ordered new stationery. Um, and it said department on it. And when we had to sort of fill in and make sure that things were listed correctly in the directory, we just sent it back with crossed out program and wrote in department. And every time there was some form or something, we just changed it. And then we started just correcting people that if anybody, like a dean or somebody, um, said program, we would correct them as though it was a slip of the tongue. And it worked. You know, I think about three decades of my life in, in our department. And there wasn't a morning I didn't wake up and believe in us, right? And believe that we were moving history, we were teaching students, we were giving them critical skills. Something was happening and our department always seemed to me to be the cutting edge. I think that they thought that we were challenging the, you know, some of the basic tenets, the, the underpinnings, the values of the Western world. And the fact is, yeah, we were. <laughs> My most precious memory of Amy Kaminsky was when she chaired the uh, search committee which interviewed me in spring of 1997. Um, and immediately after my interview, I left for the airport only to find myself trapped in a massive snowstorm and I could not leave the Minneapolis St. Paul airport uh, to go to Colorado uh, that afternoon. And I don't remember the details of how it all happened, but I ended up staying in Amy's home for two nights um, after that episode. And during this time, I ate um, all my meals with Amy and her family. And this was during these two days, the department also voted to hire me. And I, I still remember the, you know, the evening when Amy returned from campus and said that I could invite whoever I wanted to have a party with to celebrate the department's vote. And it was just so amazingly warm and wonderful. Um, and I felt like I was already a part of the department even days before I actually saw a, a written offer. Amy Kaminsky and I, along with Amy's husband, Kenny, um, have been to Argentina three times. Amy served not only as my pal and travel companion, but as my simultaneous interpreter, as I do not speak Spanish. I've also shared numerous dinners and Jewish holidays with Amy and with Kenny, and I really love them both very much. In one of my first or second years of graduate school, I was her TA for Women Write the World. And I remember being so excited about thinking about pedagogy and feminist literary criticism and how to teach these really complex ideas to undergraduates at the U. I'll always value that. And I learned so much. And I'm just so thankful that Amy was a part of my graduate experience here at the U. When she was chair, she, I think, really worked with the dean and had a way of trying to elevate the status of our department because our, our department has always been seen as, you know, that women's studies thing over there. And really learning how from her to do that graciously and interact and get administration to respect us because that's not an easy task. And how do you be radical and at the same time talk to a dean to say, oh yeah, I, we're excellent too. If those are your metrics, yes, of course we do that too. And always pressing, never letting them forget us. I mean, she's tenacious and very stubborn about always intervening. She does the work that needs to be done. She does it conscientiously. She does it well. She does it generously. Um, and she does it without, well, the Yiddish word mishagas. Um, without this sort of tying herself up to internal knots about whether she has the right to do this, the right to say that. She, does, she doesn't do that. And I, I'm in awe of her, her ability. When I think of Amy, I think of all the dinners she created for us <laughs> and just the warm love that she gave to us, especially when we were in crisis situations. 
I also have the utmost admiration for her scholarly, scholarly diligence. Amy's leadership really was um, was marked by uh, the leadership of a um, of an amazingly passionate scholar and um, and her nonstop creativity, um, as well as a very warm and generous intellectual uh, space that she created for everyone, so that we could all be individuals and we could pursue our um, our very uh, passionate dreams as as scholars, but also never taking away from the collectivity that we needed uh, to forge ahead as, as a department. Naomi is brilliant. Naomi has this incredible mind. Naomi is the one who can doze at a lecture and uh, at the end get a, you know, kind of open her eyes and ask the, the, the most important question. After a while, you kind of know what's going to happen in these talks, and you kind of get the gist of it, take a snooze. This talk is over, and she's got a, just a brilliant question. All right. So I love that about Naomi, and that's kind of my fondest memory. I think Naomi thinks of the university as a playground, and she loves going around, playing, talking. You know, that's, that's sort of... That's how I think of Naomi, as eternally enjoying it. She just brings such a, I think, an eloquence to thinking about feminist philosophy and translating it to all these different contexts. And I really appreciate the ways in which, as a philosopher, she sees all of these domains as her responsibility, that she's accountable and should be intervening in these discussions, and that's her job. She is passionate and principled, and um, she has been such a great um, role model to me as what it means to be a senior scholar, intellectual, and also an activist, um, both in on campus and as well as in the larger community. She doesn't just kind of talk the talk, she really walks the walk, right? She's an incredibly kind of trustworthy, compassionate person um, who responds to her students immediately. I mean, I would get um, emails from Naomi at two in the morning, three in the morning, uh, the day of, you know, or I would need a recommendation letter or something like that, or quick edits on on a dissertation, right? And she was the, always the first to respond with really kind of constructive feedback, but also really compassionate feedback, which I think is a lost art in academia, especially for insecure graduate students who could use a little compassion. When I was applying to graduate school, I emailed Naomi, and I remember talking with her about identity and narrative and how we come to understand ourselves through the stories that we tell about who we are. And we were talking about her classes in feminist epistemology, and I remember telling her that I would give my left kidney to be in one of her classes. Um, I'm so glad she never took me up on that, and I still have both of my kidneys. Uh, but I've also just really loved and valued all the way that Naomi has helped me think big and really pushed my ideas and helped me really think about how epistemology shapes my work and shapes feminist philosophy in general. I can't imagine my graduate career or my work as a feminist scholar without, without her influence. And I'm so glad that I got to be a part of our community and our department with her. She's just really uh, the most kind of trustworthy and responsive mentor I could have asked for, and I am immensely grateful, um, immensely grateful to have had her as an educator. I engaged in serious misbehavior around um, Jacqueline's hiring. I was chairing the search committee, and we were looking for somebody who was centrally doing biology stuff, and which Jacqueline had interest in, but I mean, she was a philosopher. And she didn't really fit the job description. And I was going through the, um, the job files one evening, and I was reading Jacqueline's, and I was completely blown away. She is a true founder in our field. And, um, there are so many ways that this kind of comes through um, in Jackie's teaching uh, and just in our personal relationship too. But I remember coming uh, to this graduate program and, and working as her TA and uh, getting to witness her in action teaching undergrads um, feminist thought and theory. 
Um, and she didn't need notes. She didn't need prompts or anything like this. She came to class every day with this knowledge and she, she knew like the back of her hand because she's lived it and truly experienced it. I will always remember my first year of graduate school um, being at the U and hearing Jackie tell all the amazing stories about protesting on Lake Street and dressing up as a dominatrix. And it just really helped me understand the history of feminism and the history of our department and uh, my own investments in the types of feminism and feminist activists and scholarship that I want to be a part of moving forward. And I will always be um, sincerely grateful for Jackie sharing that history and being so open and um, warm about her part in, in that movement. Jackie has always been a rebel. And um, when, uh, although I was hired after she, I was further advanced. So I got tenure before she did. And I was part of the group that was trying to get Jacqueline to do what she needed to do to get tenure. Okay. And that was finishing her book. But Jacqueline was much more interested in writing feminist film reviews that were going out into the world um, with being an activist, with doing the kind of writing and work that was central to the community. That's where her heart was. That's what she wanted to do. And although it made me and everybody else crazy, <laughs> because if she didn't finish that stupid book, she wasn't going to get tenure. She was almost impossible to wrestle to the ground. It's not a good idea to communicate to Jacqueline that she's supposed to behave herself. She doesn't know how to do it. She refuses to do it. She won't do it. Um, but what she did do was terrific enough that she actually did get tenure. <laughs> um, and, and most of us calmed down about it. But. What it says about Jackie is that she has always refused to um, think of her scholarship as something that lives just within academia, mm -hmm. that her life has to be about being farmer Jackie as well as scholar Jackie, right? Right. being tennis player Jackie. She's famous in my family for her tennis. Oh, really? She never sits still, right? Her mind constantly goes, and so does her body. She continues to have new ideas, to build things. So in the time that I've been here, she was NWSA president. So she was president of the national organization. She was chair. She brought us all in. She um, started the Women's Environmental Institute. You know, she's done so many different things. She was um, helping with, you know, the women's legislative internship. She wanted to start a women in leadership um, undergraduate program. Like, she never stopped having ideas. And I feel like that, too, has been such a great model for us. It's like, you don't have to do one thing. In fact, you can do wildly different things. That's okay. They're never going to be as wild as what Jackie did. <laughs> She was really showing us through, through example what the committed life of a feminist thinker and doer and teacher can look like. There's something of the soul of, of women's studies, not just at Minnesota, but I think generally, that lives within Jackie and that Jackie embodies. The three decades of my life in that department were the best ever, were the very best ever. I would not have lived a different life, period. We all were, were part of this enterprise that was women's studies, and very new, and we knew it was new, and we knew that we had to be very, very um, canny in order to make our way through the uh, the rules and regulations, the ins and outs of the administration of the structure of the university to make us as solid as we possibly could be while still thinking of ourselves essentially as insurgents. It's that sense of, you know, we're, we're in this together, we're creating something new, we're supporting each other in what we're doing, we have different styles, um, you know, different ways of being in the world. Um, it's just been wonderful.